So thank you for coming along this afternoon. Hopefully you're in here because you're interested in mental health and day one absence, or you just come back in with your bag, or these are the most comfortable seats. It can be one of the three. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Nick Reader. I'm the sales director at Medigold Health. Um, I've been told to not make it too salesy today, which is always an interesting concept for a sales director. Um, hence why I've brought along Alan Bradshaw, my associate, um, who is our associate director of mental health. Uh, we've got a presentation for you today around mental health in the public sector, absence management and, and how that can help, um, and, and all of it in relation to occupational health. So feel free either you know, to ask questions as we go through or keep them to the end. I'm sure you'll have loads of burning questions for us. Um, and I'll hand over to Alan um, as a start. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, nice, to be, nice to be here. Um, do I need to be standing in front of the microphone? Could you hear Nick okay? Yeah. I'm quite loud. You're quite loud. Nick is quite loud. Um, yes, I, um, I was here. Uh, I did a talk um, um, uh, a couple of years ago here, um, r r sort of in, to a related topic. And I have to tell you, the last time I, I was here, I got into trouble. Um, and, um, and what had happened was that uh, I told this um, story, I thought, well, I, I illustrate a sort of stress management technique and application. And I told this story about how I found very challenging, very long distance journeys, because I live in Scotland, as you might be able to tell by my accent, <coughs> how, I'm, how I found challenging long distance journeys if, um, if somebody who sniffed a lot um, as was sitting next to me. Uh, for, for, for very many hours and I'd said to the, the audience that I'd developed some, I developed some stress management plans, some if-then plans uh, uh, for dealing with it and, um, and it was quite good and it was about this same time of day and it seemed to wake people up and people thought it was quite entertaining and, um, and so I sort of carried on with my story and I thought oh, that, 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 that went quite well um, and then later on, um, uh, later on in the day um, at one of the break times, I was sitting down, um, just having a cup of tea, and I saw this man what, striding towards me, and I thought, well, this isn't going well. Uh, and he was striding towards me with this very sort of very very purposeful look, and uh, he looked very angry, and I thought, oh dear, this is not so good. And uh, so he, he walked towards me and stood over me and said, I am a sniffer, and then he turned around and walked rapidly out of the. Uh, <laughs> rapidly out of the uh, auditorium. So uh, I want to say I am truly sorry. Um, if the sniffer is here today, I really didn't mean it. I was just sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, telling a, telling a story. So, um, so I want to talk about uh, mental health more particularly in the context of occupational health. Um, I'm a business psychologist and I've been working in this field, particularly around stress management for about for about 20, 20 odd years and um, have grown um, uh, businesses and companies in this, uh, in this sector. Um, <clears throat> and there's no doubt that uh, stress and mental health at work are and remain uh, a huge problem. Uh, lots of these headlines, I picked up on these headlines, BBC headlines, headlines in The Guardian and elsewhere, um, no doubt you'll have seen some of these headlines. And there was a big story about three days ago. I don't know if you picked up on it. Anybody pick up on what the big stress story was about three days ago? Fire. It was the fire service, yeah. So the story went that, um, that stress-related absence, particularly long-term mental health absence, had risen by 30% in the past six years. And in fact, it had actually doubled in London. Um, so that's really very concerning. Um, but it isn't just absence which is related to these problems around stress. Um, there's all sorts of other issues. Uh, retention of staff, uh, quality of working life, the organisation's reputation. There are legal issues and all sorts of industrial relations issues. Um, and so the problem is not just one of absence, although we are going to talk and Nick is going to talk particularly about an intervention aimed really very much at absence, but there's more to it 
uh, more to it than that. Um, and there's no doubt that, that, that it is a problem. Um, is that uh, your experience? Do you feel that there's a, a major problem about stress in the, in the public sector? Now, how does it manifest itself where, where, where you work? Is it just an absence issue or is it broader than that? It's a performance issue as well, I think. Yes, very much so. I mean, it most definitely does affect people's performance at work, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, and one of the sort of uh, main things there potentially is decision making, people making bad decisions. There's a, there's a big overlap with some of our clients around issues of safety. And a lot of the worst safety disasters have indeed, well, stress has been a, uh, a significant element, uh, element of that. Um, what's the problem? Well, some of my experience um, over the past uh, 20 odd years, um, well, stress hasn't gone away. Um, people at work are stressed. Um, are they more stressed than they were? I think the evidence is that they are, in fact, more stressed than they were. Um, and some professional groups and many public sector um, uh, people, uh, uh, different kinds of public sector jobs, especially so, and we know that a lot of these jobs are quite high up on the league table, and it most definitely has negative consequences, and some of those headlines we've just looked at uh, relate to some of those, um, some of those consequences. Um, I found that organisations adopt the wrong strategies, well, maybe wrong, I put in inverted commas. Very much it's been about support and not necessarily about prevention over, the, over my experience. Um, and I've also found that, that stress and mental health and well-being are placed in silos and that really hasn't helped. So for example, well-being um, overlapping with a bit of mental health is very much has been an HR area and work-related stress from a risk point of view has been very much a health and safety uh, silo. And those two are sometimes at war, I've found, with each other in the same organisation and that causes all sorts of problems. Um, I found there has been a major disconnect between leaders and followers um, and that's actually particularly in the NHS I've found that um, I've done risk assess stress risk assessment work with groups of nurses for example and we found very strong disconnect uh, between um, senior managers and people actually doing the job on the ground and they felt totally detached. Still a, a big lack of awareness and still a stigma a, big, a major stigma around stress and mental health at work. Yes, we are talking a bit more about it than we were, but there's still a major stigma there. Uh, that stops people coming forward and, um, and talking about these issues, and that leads to, uh, that, well, the opposite of early intervention, obviously. Uh, managers remain, I think, ill-equipped to manage these stress risks at work, and they don't have the right tools, and I'll say a wee bit more about that in a wee while. And most definitely, I've found there to be a lack of trust. Organisations and leadership and senior management teams, very often I've found, don't trust their own line managers to actually manage issues of around stress and mental health at work, perhaps even more general, generally around managing health at work. Some very important developments. Um, some of these you might be aware of, some of these you might not be so aware of. Um, have you all come across the management standards? Some yes, some no. Um, so the management standards were launched in 2004 by Health and Safety Executive and they provided a framework um, and, um, and indeed some, uh, and a tool if you like to help organisations and let them know how what they should be doing to assess and manage the risks posed by work-related stress. Um, and there were six broad categories of things identified as work-related stress hazards, in fact, um, issues around demands, or particularly around excessive workloads, a lack of control at work, control second area, issues around support, people not feeling supported at work, um, issues around relationships, particular, particularly negative, behaviours at work, bullying, harassment, conflict at work, a lack of clarity about roles and then aspects of roles conflicting with each other, and lastly, poor management of change. 
And so, and, and that was all related to research and we knew, you know, we really know that those are really the main sort of areas. Um, and uh, indeed we can, you know, we can assess and, uh, and survey those areas and, and there are tools to help us do that. A second key development was something called stress management competency tools. Have you come across stress management competencies as a term? Some people have, yes, some people know. Um, there was a lot of research that was completed in 2010 into stress management competencies. And stress management competencies are those skills and behaviours that managers need to uh, prevent and reduce stress at work. And some excellent tools were developed and it was all done by publicly funded research. And so those tools are publicly available. It's been a great development, but I haven't seen a lot of evidence that uh, organizations are making use of those tools to develop uh, their managers. Um, uh, NICE Guidance, uh, National Institute of, um, used to be, so that's the Institute of, of Care, does that know what NICE stands for? <laughs> it used to be clinical and, clinical and care now it is. Uh, yes. Health and peer excellence, yes. So it's it's kind of broadened out, but they developed some great stuff around promoting well-being at work. Um, PH22 was the sort of uh, sort of code number for that. Uh, you'd find that online. Some great resources. Um, so worth having a look uh, for that. Mental health first aid. Now that's really people have become a lot more aware of mental health first aid. Um, have you come across mental health first aid? Um, how many people um, have mental health first aid, have mental health first aiders in their organization? Can I put a show of hands? So if, uh, there are some there, but obviously not, 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 um, you know, not everyone, but it certainly is a good development um, and, um, and, and it does pretty much what it says in the tin, uh, provides um, uh, training up people to be signposts to, to, to good services. Um, something called the, um, there is, there are sector specific stuff around mates and mind, which is uh, to do with construction. Another one, a uh, development of the work health toolbox, a guy called Professor Kim Burton and his colleagues came up with this. And that's a great thing as well. And so I would urge you to have a look at that. You'll find that if you put this work health toolbox into a search engine, you'll find some great stuff. Um, a really meaty report uh, published by the Health and Safety uh, Laboratory. Um, um, some good stuff there I would urge you to have a look at. Um, World, World Mental Health Day, uh, another uh, good development. Um, it's coming up on the 10th of October. There'll be lots of things going on. Um, certainly there's conferences going on. I'm attending a conference related to that. And that's raised issues of awareness. I've seen leaders' involvement and openness and candor about the issue suddenly becoming much more to the fore. Have you heard of the Minds at Work um, network? Worth having a look at that, actually. Um, it's more pat particularly aimed at leaders, um, hopefully getting um, involving leaders to talk much more openly about their own experiences of mental, uh, mental health issues. And um, I think uh, what I've seen over the past 10 years uh, especially has been the rise of positive psychology as a, as a, as a sort of big thing in terms of um, um, people thinking about that in terms of what happens at work. Positive psychology essentially being the science of what makes us feel good and well as opposed to the science of what makes us stress an stressed, anxious and depressed. And there's all sorts of very good stuff out there about positive psychology. So lots of very good developments, but how it's not necessarily really fed into what actually happens um, at work. Um, a few years ago, I started to think about, well, what does best practice look like? Could I, could I come up with some kind of best practice model? I was doing work with employers and with trade unions at the time. Um, I noted, notably, I was doing quite a lot of work with the trade union prospect. Um, and um, I, I, it made uh, the work I was doing at the time caused me to really think about well, what might best practice stress management best practice look like? Could I put together some kind of a simple model? 
Um, and based upon all of the research, all of the evidence that I could see out there, based upon my own experience, um, I, when I really thought about it, I felt it came down to four key areas. And these are those areas. Um, awareness, uh, prevention, um, monitoring, and responding. Um, um, and all of them, I think, really are necessary if, necessary if we really want to grasp the issue of managing stress and mental health at work. How well do you think we're doing related to those four areas? Any we're doing really well, do you think? Awareness. Awareness, we're getting a lot better, I think, at that. Much improved awareness. Lots of these publicity, PR campaigns, the online social media, that's made a big difference. Um, and to some extent, we've got a little bit better at monitoring, and we certainly there, there's a lot more out there and has been quite a lot out there in terms of responding. Lots of stuff around employee assistance programs and counselling and therapy and CBT, which was talked about earlier on. But the one I put in red there really is the one where I think that we're really doing very badly on, which is prevention. Um, and that's really a key, er key area. And it's certainly one where I do lots of, I, I end up doing lots of work, lots of consultancy work supporting um, organizations with looking at mental health strategy, workplace mental health strategy, uh, coming up with uh, workable, practicable policies um, about what we need to know, what managers need to do, um, what employees can do, and where to access support, and so on. And then a big, big aspect of prevention is around these behaviors, around leadership and manager behaviors. And so there's a big job to be done, and still a huge job to be done around the stress management competencies and leadership competency, competencies that help to prevent and reduce uh, uh, stress at work. So before I you know, hand over to Nick, and, I'll, um, and, and, and Nick's gonna talk a bit more um, in depth about a very specific intervention around absence management, I think from all of my time in this field, I've found that the, probably the biggest area for me that I've ended up getting involved in, probably much more than any other area, is around um, managers and what managers need to know and do um, in terms of managing these kinds of risks at work. Um, managers have got this really key and critically important role. They're at the sort of blunt end of stress management as far as I'm concerned. And, the evidence backs that up as well. They, they're in a position to actually spot things at an early, an early stage, and they're in a really, uh, potentially a very good position to do something about the issues or risks that they uh, identify. But obviously they need to be trained, they need to know what to do, when and why. Obviously that is something that we can cover within training. But we can also provide managers with simple tools uh, risk management tools, and that can be provided during training, and, um, and increasingly we can we can look at providing some of these things as well online and not just on a sort of face-to-face -face, uh, training um, uh, aspect. Um, but one of the things that also which I found, and I think this is a really tricky area, I think we need to do much more, and I try and talk to directors and boards and senior management teams about, is that managers themselves really need quite a lot of support. They do need support and trust from leaders um, and from the organization. Um, if we want managers to take some responsibility for managing these issues, we've got to sort of trust them and give them uh, support. And support structures that, such as the what Nick is gonna talk about very shortly are very, very helpful to that. Um, their key role needs to definitely be acknowledged within strategy and policy. We need to be very, very clear about, well, what, what do we expect managers to do uh, 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 and why? Um, positive relationships with leaders, um, their leaders and their peers. Managers are the same as everyone else. They have a great need for social support, support from their peers, support from the organization, support is one of those key um, management standards and um, I think we could do a lot better than we do at the moment. Um, 
they need, uh, we need to have these robust systems and support structures. And uh, uh, Nick's going to talk about one very specific form of uh, support structure around absence management. I suppose the last thing I want to say just uh, briefly before handing over to Nick is about time, is that I often end up talking to managers about time and about how they manage their time. And what I've found is that managers are uh, managers themselves are under sometimes under so much pressure and they're also they're not only a manager but they're also a practitioner and there's a tension between being a manager and a, being a practitioner and when those two things come into conflict what tends to happen I found is that the manager the manager part it ends up much of much lower priority and I think that we've got to really have a rethink about managers and how they spend their time and that uh, and if we can get managers to utilize their time in a better way in terms of prioritizing people management activities then that potentially can make an enormous difference um, so that's me a very broad brush hope you know hopefully you might have some questions a little bit later on and um, I'm, I'm happy to answer anything uh, I don't want to get into the sniffing thing though uh, I've already done that, uh, and I, I, I paid a terrible price the last time. So, I'll hand over to Nick. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Okay, so um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically around absence management, um, which is my area of specialty, and, and something that I've been doing for 10 years, and something I get very passionate about, um, which my friends love, because when I talk to them about it, they just kind of glaze over and don't want to know because I've been speaking about it for so long. I've also, as I said, I've been told not to make it too salesy. So what I thought I would do initially is I've got a little two minute kind of an animated video on, on what day one absence management is and, and how the, the service works. And, and I thought it's quite a clever way of getting around me making, not making it too salesy and, and playing the video so that it gives day one absence management some context. And then I can talk about mental health and stress uh, and, and managing absence um, kind of in a roundabout sort of way so it's not too salesy as I say so um, I'll run the video and, and then I'll come back it's only about two minutes long Your employees like Jane their most important asset employee well-being is top of the agenda for all compassionate and diligent employers when employers fail to look after their staff, this means staff stay sick for longer, resulting in absences costing employers £29 billion per annum and millions of days in lost productivity. As an organisation that prides itself in keeping people in work safe and well, Medigold Health is proud to provide our customers with a collaborative absence management journey. Jane falls sick and she can't attend work, so she calls the Medigold Health Absence Line and reports her absence to a friendly call advisor. The advisor records all relevant information on our dedicated system, Medigold One, and offers details of her well-being options. Managers are immediately informed of Jane's absence details and are provided with access to all the information they need to support her. Medigold Health's trained occupational health nurses are also alerted and in appropriate cases, they offer the employee more clinically focused support. This can result in a massively reduced absence period. When Jane returns to health and subsequently to work, she contacts the advisor. The advisor updates Jane's Medigold One profile. The manager is informed and then prompted to complete a return to work form that is generated by the Medigold One system to assist them. Senior management and HR can drill down into the accurate absence data, enabling them to change the way they run their business and to proactively improve the health and engagement of their key asset, their employees. Medigold Health's Day One service has a proven record in absence reduction and has saved organisations millions of pounds and thousands of days in regained productivity and efficiency. But most importantly, we've done what we do best to help businesses like yours have happier, healthier, and more engaged employees. There you go, hopefully that wasn't too painful. Um, I think it would have been a bit remiss of me as the sales director not to push its service slightly, but 
in terms of myself and my and my kind of area of expertise, and, and the, as I say, the last ten years, I think just absence management in general is is often an area that's that's missed. Um, it was interesting sitting in on some of the the talks today and, and hearing about the mental health side of things, um, and, and people talking very specifically about the general public and their mental health. Um, and I was kind of sat there thinking, well, yes, that's that's great, but you know, you've got to think about employees as well because they're all people. Um, and with, a, with stress now being the highest reason for absence there is, um, a couple of years back it overtook musculoskeletal absence, so stress, anxiety, depression, all of those areas are very, very high in terms of organisational absence. Um, it, it, it really is something that I, I kind of struggle with sometimes in terms of organisations and, and, ha and how processes are sometimes broken. Uh, I, I work with HR a lot, and policies and procedures are always very good on paper, but actually in terms of managers actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and following those policies, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect. Um, and managers aren't always aware of processes and certainly don't feel supported enough by the organisations they're working for in terms of dealing with their own employees' absence. I mean, I've, as I said, I've worked probably with about 140 very large organisations Specifically in terms of the NHS, probably about 30 trusts and a very similar number of councils, very large councils that I've worked with. Um, and really, all, all the time, the same challenges keep coming up in terms of managing absence. Um, and, you, you know, it's a kind of a catch-22 and a vicious circle where you're constantly being asked to do more with less people. So you've got more people going off with stress all of the time. And then, again... A, the people that are then left at work are getting stressed and their workloads are increasing. Um, and, and time and time again, it really comes down to a couple of key areas in terms of the organisations. The first one being poor data. Um, and it was interesting, again, listening earlier to, to conversations around more joined up approaches and, and having a, a more holistic, wider view um, on uh, organisations and organisations working together and this is one thing that I've always pushed for uh, in terms of absence management is actually organisations using the data that they, that they have um, and actually getting managers to collect that in, in a uniform way. Um, I, I don't, again it's tricky because I'm used to dealing with HR and I know a lot of um, yourselves and, and the guys here today aren't specifically HR but one of the issues with managers is when they're capturing absence details, they often don't put the reason for absence down. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a bit geeky and I love data. And if, if that information isn't being collected at the front end, then that can't be sort of passed on. And then in terms of really understanding what's going on within organisations, it, it's very difficult. Um, and then that always makes me wonder, well, how do organisations then set up their wellbeing initiatives and how do they have a really clear focus and steer on what's going on in the organisation. And often, I have to be honest, it, it feels like it's a bit of a finger in the wind in terms of, OK, well, we know we have to have occupational health. Perhaps we'll do a little bit of health surveillance and we, we'll, we'll monitor sort of uh, blood sugar levels. And, but actually, there's no real kind of data and evidential stuff going on underneath that uh, in terms of what the organisation should do. Um, so you get under under reporting on absence, it takes a long time for managers, if they are collecting data, to get that back to a central point, and then for HR to do anything with that. And by that time, you're kind of four to six weeks past somebody going off, coming back, and it's very reactionary um, rather than kind of a proactive approach to, to managing these things. Um, in terms of managers themselves, you know, manager compliance isn't great to policies and procedures. And um, as Alan touched upon, and as I'm sure you're aware, you know, Alan, uh, uh, managers have 101 different things that they have to do on a daily basis. So when it comes to things like absence management and managing those things properly, it usually sits a lot lower on their or order of priorities than it should do. So really it's about raising the awareness of that and giving those managers a bigger picture in terms of the knock-on effects that that has to an organisation. Um, I know working with a lot of NHS trusts that really are being, you know, headcounts are being squeezed down, but the workloads are increasing. So you're being asked to do a lot more with less people. And if those individuals are then going off with stress, it's just compounding the issues. 
So the whole idea really is around early intervention and, and signposting and, and getting people into the right health and wellbeing pathways quickly and efficiently. Um, because if you're not doing that, then people are going to be off for a lot longer than they need to be. And, and I've spent a lot of time over the years talking to organisations and managers. And some of the stories I hear about people being off for months and months before they even get referred into any kind of well-being pathways is actually quite scary sometimes. Um, you know, and that's all coming back to that productivity and efficiency piece. I know it sounds quite cold and calculated, but you, you know, to in order to help people, you have to be aware of those issues in the first place and get them into those pathways as quickly as possible. So if, if you set up triggers and alerts for those kind of things and they're speaking to individuals on the first day that they, they go off, then you can highlight that to the relevant people and get them into those pathways quickly. Um, in terms of the day one service uh, and absence management in general, it, it's good to have a medical professional, uh, in, in our case it's an occupational health nurse, at the end of a phone line. So if somebody goes off on day one of an absence and they need to speak to some, a medical professional for whatever reason, then having them on the phone and, and available to then push those individuals down those pathways it, is quite a key thing. Um, and something that generally isn't available in, in large organisations. And that's private sector as much as it is public sector. Um, I spent a lot of time working with private. Actually, in fairness, public sector organisations tend to be more aware of the fact that they have issues around absence. Um, but don't, I think it's fair to say don't necessarily always act as quickly as the private sector. The problem with the private sector is half the time they're not even aware that they have absence issues in the first place is, is kind of my general understanding. So really, uh, the idea is to put a framework around all of the really good existing policies and procedures that organisations have in place to make sure that managers do actually do the things that they're supposed to be doing. But at the same time, they're supported in doing that. Um, and employees have access to medical advice. The, pro the problem sometimes with employees when they go off is the issue is the manager. And if, if they... If they're meant to report that to their manager, then they sometimes feel like they have nowhere to turn. So it's about providing alternative pathways for them and helping them to interact with HR to solve those issues. And a lot of the time, making sure that when they're going off on longer term absences, they don't start to fall through the net and then don't want to come back to work. So again, it's a, you know, getting people back to work on reduced duties. Um, and just keeping the workforce at work by keeping them healthy, um, then you're going to reduce the strain on the NHS and other organisations who are being asked to do a lot more with less. I've got a, a piece on how the service works, but I'm going to skip past that for today to talk a little bit about the bigger picture. Um, again, we're starting to look at things. This is where I think data is really useful, um, and, and the geek in me gets really excited because... Um, a lot of the information that we collect is really useful in terms of feeding that into health and well-being and mental health, all the, all the areas really within an organisation. And nowadays with technology, you know, things like smart watches and everything else, it's, it's very easy to collect a tonne of data on individuals um, and, and really their kind of lifestyle and what they're doing to, to be healthy and, and feed that all in again to the bigger picture. Um, and I just think that a more informed organisation has a much better steer then in terms of what wellbeing initiatives they should have. Um, as an occupational health organisation and a sales director, obviously when we work with organisations, we want them to spend their money with us. But I, th I think the key thing is that for that to be money well spent and the organisation to get a really good return on that money. Um, and, and the only way to do that really is to really evidence the effect that those initiatives are having for the employees within the organisation. So if they're going through a particular pathway, does that get them back to work quicker? Does that reduce the strain on the organisation? All of those type things that the data can help you evidence really clearly. I, mean, I, I often get asked why day one absence management services work, but just I just think in, in general absence management, why is it effective? Why can it be a really useful tool for managers to use? And it really is a couple of key areas around early intervention and signposting. Um, and, and I go back to that time and time again, but why wait for somebody's manager who, you know, to take a month to refer somebody into the occupational health service when somebody's been off? 
why not, if the criteria is right, get those individuals referred into those services on day one, if, if the criteria is right? And then you're knocking, you know, if you can knock a couple of weeks off a long-term absence, it doesn't sound like a lot for an organisation, but you times that by 2,000 individuals who have got, a, you know, a 5 to 8% absence rate, and it's quite prolific numbers that you're talking about. You start saving them millions of pounds. Um, and for me, just as importantly, you know, increasing the productivity of that organisation. So all of these great initiatives that I've heard about today around mental health, having the actual employees at work doing those things is key. And if they're off ill, then, you know, they're not going to be doing that. And that places a strain on the organisation. Because public sector-wise, you know, uh, I, I still hear of six months full pay, six months half in terms of people being off. And, and again, financially, that's a big strain on an organisation. So if you can reduce all of those costs, then that money can be spent in other areas. Um, and, you know, that comes back to real-time data and how, helping HR to really understand what's going on within the organisation and act proactively. When, when suddenly you get, you know, one division and loads of people going off with diarrhoea and vomiting or whatever it might be, if stress is increasing, then really looking at the reasons for that in those particular areas and working out really effective interventions to stop that from happening pretty much in real time rather than six, you know, six weeks later when it's already happened, there's loads of people off and you're kind of a bit ineffective at what you can do other than trying to get those people back. So you know, helping managers through the process, um, something that Alan mentioned, it's kind of carrot and stick. Give them all the tools they need in order to be able to do it, but at the same time, monitor what they're doing and make sure that that's happening as and when it should. And that, again, will just speed up the process and make the organisation much more effective. And, and then the compliance piece. So, again, tracking what managers are doing, making sure they're doing it in the right kind of time scales, um, and, and when they're not, giving them the help and advice they need to help to upskill them, especially around areas like stress. Um, again, I'm quite geeky, but quite an interesting statistic is return to works that managers do when in individuals go back to work. Generally, you know, managers can be pretty good at doing them, but the one area they always seem to shy away from is when somebody's been off with a stress-related absence. They, you know, they just seem to get be scared to get involved in those types of conversations, and that's probably because they are quite tricky conversations to have. So if you can help those individuals, guide them. Things like um, return to works that have specific questions on around stress-related absence to help the manager to ask some really pertinent questions of that individual because it's a great opportunity when they're coming back into work to make sure that the organisation did everything they could to help that individual um, and that that individual was aware of all the wellbeing initiatives that were available to them through the organisation. Those kind of things are key. Rather than it just being a tick box exercise, hi Bob, you're back, great, how you feeling, off you go. Getting some really good information and data to then feed back in to the, the overall management information piece to, to keep you know, managers and, and, and senior managers and HR in the picture as to what's happening. Um, I mentioned the about the future. We're, we're kind of getting into predictive analytics now. So, Rather than just saying this is what's happened in the organisation in the last four to six weeks, we've started to predict what's happening in future um, from an employee level right up to the organisational level. And that's where it starts to get really interesting. That's things around, um, you know, rostering and planning and staffing levels and all of that, those types of things, which, are, you know, is essential, especially within the NHS where replacement overtime and agency costs run into tens of scary, scary things, tens of millions, it's making that a much more accurate process and having the, the right people at work for more of the time. And that in itself will reduce stress and, and help to improve mental health. Um, but as I say, tracking things, most people have smartphones now and watches, so the, the amount of data that you can pull from those is actually quite scary um, in terms of tracking. It's kind of big brother, but... Um, if you use it in a, in a proactive, useful way, then you can really get into what's happening within your sort of employee base. And, and for me, that's something I would have, you know, senior management, CEO level, really understanding your workforce. Um, it's got to be one of the top priorities. I mean, it's, it's the biggest cost to the organisation. 
and by doing it effectively, this couple, of, you know, um, back to a salesy slide, but you, I've always been a believer that, you know, absence is going to be there. It's never going to go away, but actually in terms of managing it properly and reducing it effectively, there's so much more that can be done. Um, and it's something that I've been passionate about for 10 years, and I, I still see a big disconnect. I, I, I think there's almost kind of been a mentality that absence is there, there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, and, and really, that's if you join, if you link everything up uh, and start looking not just at organisations, but what's happening within the sectors, uh, um, and really providing a lot of accurate, meaningful data, then you can manage it and bring it down um, a lot more effectively. Uh, that's pretty much.